the underbiking world championships reminds me of well your sense of humor and it's can be very dry can be very sarcastic and of course the danger of that is on online sarcasm often falls flat yeah you need a sarcasm font sometimes for sure that's right that would help maybe we should bring back flashing <laughs> fonts but um have you ever had your sarcasm your humor go colossally wrong i've definitely had people misinterpret it but that makes sometimes makes me laugh even more for sure Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, and with me on this episode is Matt Hansen. How's it going, Matt? What do you mean on this episode? I'm on every episode. Pretty much. Really super. Thanks for asking. Terry McCall is on assignment. We've got him really busy. He's also looking ahead to Sea Otter. So that man's hair is on fire and unfortunately will not be joining us this episode. He did help me out with preparing my interview with Jeff Kabush, the uh, the legend. I know we like to throw that word around a lot, but, you know, he's a bit of a legend. And uh, it was good to talk to him. And, of course, we are going to talk about Roubaix. The bike race. The bike race. Perry Roubaix. Dare I say it is uh, Roubaix, Canadian style? No, please don't. Roubaix? No, no, don't. How's it going, Roubaix? No, please stop. Let's get into uh, the race in northern France that's been uh, recently canuckified. Very canuckified. This podcast is coming out not long after a fantastic weekend of racing in northern France. Historic for Canadian cycling as uh, we screamed at our televisions as Allison Jackson came into the velodrome in Roubaix in a lead group. And, man, it was a nail-biter, wasn't it, Matt? Right to, right to the end. What did they have at the end? 12 seconds over, the, over the, the, the chase group, let's call them? I mean, it was, you know, I said this to you during, and I always think it's crazy when one group's coming in to do their, their last lap and another group's entering the velodrome. I mean, they almost kind of, you know... They could see each other, obviously, on, on that very long track. But uh, yeah, on, and Allison, just the sight of Allison Jackson waving everyone along. You know, let's go, let's go, let's go. In the last couple of kilometers, driving the brake was uh, pretty phenomenal. It was totally phenomenal. And let's back up before we even get to the velodrome. Allison Jackson was in a group that got away early and they, they stayed away despite, you know, uh, less than ideal road conditions. I don't know what ideal road conditions are in Roubaix. There's problems when it's dry, it's problems when it's wet, and there's problems when it's a mix. And they stayed away. What was also phenomenal was the luck that Jackson had. She made her own luck by being in that break and by staying well positioned the whole time. But riders went down around her, including in the velodrome itself. Femke Marcus. Exactly. Femke Marcus crashed. And you had some insight as to, to, you know, you think you're home free, you're in the velodrome, but still uh, the surface there can give you some problems. Well, it's like anyone who's ridden on, a, on an asphalt surface when you're going by some paint, you know, it's just a tiny bit of water. It doesn't make anything. And that blue apron just becomes ice. So I, I think it, was, it wasn't, you know, super wet because obviously she wouldn't have gone onto it, but just a little bit of residual rain is you're going to go down like on ice. So it sucks for her because there she is in the mix and kaboom. It just shows, too, you said with the luck, you know, in, in Roubaix is that, you know, I've heard people say I crashed five times, had three flats. If I only had four crashes, I would have won, you know, stuff like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and to that point, we saw the rides of uh, Mariana Voss. She had terrible luck really early on, needed a bike change, and she finishes a respectable 10th and, and she had to fight, though, for that 10th. Elisa longo Borghini, last year's Roubaix champion, crashed about 37 kilometers to go. She kept fighting. She finished about 23 seconds down. It's a race where you, you just keep going. But I think the thing you said about, you know, we, we, we should be careful. When we say Jackson, you know, there was no luck on her side. She made her own luck. And even being in that break early was actually 
a smart move because then, of course, she avoids the crazy traffic and all the, you know, the people crashing left, right, and center. Of course, it was pretty touch and go at the end there, but she made that thing last. You know, even Linda Jackson said something to the sense that, you know, as soon as she saw her enter the uh, the velodrome, she knew she had it, you know, because she'd never seen someone work so hard and, and she believed in herself and she just kind of forced all the other riders. You know, remember that, that waving on the other riders, that, that image, and then, I mean, she made that race hers, so... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And of course, Linda Jackson is the original Action Jackson of Canadian Cycling and the founder of Allison Jackson's team, EF Education, TIBCO SVB. So there's that that Canadian continuity there. Like, in a way, this uh, win is Linda Jackson's long game come to fruition. All that hard work. 20 years almost. Yeah, no, I think that's what she said. You know, this was obviously the biggest... Obviously, the team has changed names over the years and had additional sponsors. But I think she said she started with like five thousand dollars, something like that, two thousand and four, yeah, two thousand and five, and and here they are winning the biggest one day race on the planet. Pretty cool symmetry. What strikes me about her win? Okay, here's my take. I like her win a thousand times better than Matthew Vanderpool's the day after, and not because of nationalism, but the the fact that she stayed with the group kept this group going, and then still had something in the tank to win the final sprint. It was just, like I said, such a nail-biter, whereas... But that's why. That's why she pushed the brake, right? I mean, that like she knew. She knew she had the legs that she could out-sprint all those women in the group, and I think she was just being a smart bike racer because she knew if she entered that velodrome, her, the race was hers. That's why she was being so adamant about it, which is cool. And the men's race... The, it was deflated. Uh, we're going to get into deflation a little later in the men's race. But it was deflated when, well, Van Aert had a puncture. And then that duel that we we so wanted to see was just didn't happen. Didn't happen because, well, there you go. That's Roubaix. I mean, who knows what the sprints between those two. It seems like it's always different. You know, we saw the world's Vanderpool snuck up away on him. and But I, I mean, I would, I would probably say what well, would probably take him by the same time a two-man break after 260K, I mean, you never know, right? I mean, it's so hard to say. Vanderpool is pretty quick. More on the men's race. The CanCon story there is, of course, Derek G, uh, Olympic track cyclist, and he's riding his first year at the top levels of the sport uh, on the road with Israel Premier Tech. Last year, he was on the, uh, he was on the development team, uh, Israel Cycling Academy. He's had a pretty uh, good year so far. He did a bunch of uh, stage races early on. He did Milan San Remo, and he gets in the break at Perry Roubaix, his first Perry Roubaix. It just, you know, so excited to see him in the break. You know, it's it's probably not going to stay away. But you know, any second you're at the front of the one of the biggest races in the world. He enters the mythical Arenberg Forest. I think he said something like, "It was the greatest moment of my life." And the worst moment of my life when he punctures, like pretty, pretty early on. But he said he entered, you know, the forest first guy, you know, the first guy to enter forest and then kaboom. So uh, that just shows, like, you know, that, that's what cycling is. It's these ups and downs, right, within a minute or two. And it happens so quickly. I got in touch with him shortly after the race. And he said, yeah, he came zooming into the Arenberg Forest. Pretty much that's when the puncture started. Uh, we saw on, on the live stream, it the tire just peeled off. I mean, I can't believe he stayed upright. That was the most impressive part. So that's what I asked him. How did he do that? And he thinks, well, he's a bit humble about it. He says it was luck. He was on the tops. He was holding the tops so he couldn't reach for the brakes. Right. And he just had to hold on and ride that out on the cobbles and let those brutal rocks bring him to a stop, which thankfully he did. He was upright. He was at the side of the road. And um, then he had to wait for a bike. It was great because even though we didn't get to watch this, he still rode on. And not only that, so he finishes the race. He's not sure if he make the time cut because they got to figure out the percentage. And I think he had, he finished 135th, 25 minutes and 44 seconds behind Vanderpool. And the cutoff was 26 and change. So he, I think he had about half a minute to spare. And, you know, for me, I always say cycling's about the winners and the losers, right? It's that. It's the guy who wins, obviously, and it's that guy who finishes dead last just by the seat of his pants. And, and you know, no offense, to Eric, I don't mean that in a bad way, but I'm saying it's just it's amazing that he wrote it out. Because a lot of people would say, screw this, I'm going to the showers, right? Like, why would I ride solo? He had to wait five minutes for a, a wheel change, right? He knows he's screwed. 
but he still went on and finished. And I think that's a kind of amazing story. Well, what you were saying harkens to that idea of the Lantern Rouge in the in the, the Tour de France. It, the last place finisher uh, is, in a way, uh, showing the, the grit and the determination that uh, we all love to see in cycling. And you're honoring that grit and determination. And uh, yeah, Derek G showed it. Uh, what he said to me was he feels he got he got the whole Perry Roubaix package with the breakaway, uh, the Armberg Forest, the 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 mechanical, and coming in uh, at just uh, just ahead of the cutoff. Uh, so yeah, that's a quite the debut. Uh, I hope we see more of him at future Perry Roubaix. You know, from what it sounds like, obviously, they're going 50K an hour, getting in that early break. Everyone wants to, not everyone, all of the, the certain guys want to get in the early break to get some TV time and also get out there for their team. And it sounded like he tried multiple times to get in the early break. But, of course, that's easier said than done. So I guess he finally did get into the early break. And he's like, wow, he did it, you know. But uh, that's the cool part, too, you know, he, he that I actually made the early break. Now, back to... Uh... A legend that is not in the making, but has been uh, being crafted over about 20 years, Jeff Kabush. Uh, and yes, we're getting away from the road, even though those those pavés are barely classifiable as road. Um, I was on Carrefour de Labra once on a road bike, and I definitely thought a mountain bike would have been much, much better. It's basically underbiking, as Kabush would call it. Exactly. <laughs> One of the oldest underbiking races in the world. But from that, we move to Jeff Kabush. And he's always interesting to talk to. He's always got uh, some deep in insights, whether it's gear or training. And he brings his very dry, very sarcastic sense of humor. So what struck me about this conversation is the word balance. It's a it's a word he brought up a lot. And I'm not going to detail in every manner in which he used it. But I think it's telling that a man who recognizes the importance of balance is a man who gets to be racing or is still racing uh, at the age of uh, tomorrow, at the age of 46. You know, one thing I can say about Kabush is I stayed at his place many years ago with him and Andrew Pinfold and some other pro mountain bikers, Trish Sinclair and Max Plaxen. He had a house in Esquimalt. Was, he was one of the first guys, and this wasn't that long ago, um, that really did a lot of core work. Um, he trained methodically. Um, I was basically injured and I sat in his wheel for a, a winter and that's how I got fit, just looking at him um, from behind. So, <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding with going these rides and now it's, I just sat in his wheel. Um but, uh, you know, he did a lot of core stuff, he did a lot of ab stuff, recognizing that, of course, um, you know, when he sits on a bike, he's, he's really got a nice position because his upper body doesn't move. He's just putting all that, that power into the pedals. I'm sure it's the same on the mountain bike. And it's because he, he does the extra stuff, you know, like it's, it's, you can, sure you can go out ride five, six hours every day, do intervals, whatever you need to do. But without that strength from, from your upper body, from your core, you might be losing a lot of energy. And that's one thing I always thought about his diligence was that, and he's also a super nice guy. Yes, actually. And he's also generous in his advice for young riders. Now, he doesn't have a formal um, coaching or advisory role, but I know, uh, yeah, if young riders come to him with questions, he's he's happy to share and share his knowledge and, and help out. And he's also definitely, I think that's one thing I like about him, too, is that even, I mean, I know he's getting into the twilight of his career, so to speak, even though he's still super fast. Even when he was the top of his game, I always think he was very approachable to anyone. And he wasn't, there was no kind of, snobbiness like he would talk to anyone like a you know like an equal and i think that was something that always impressed me the way he was mm -hmm. because there are some cyclists that can be kind of snobby no yes okay um but you're right and i'd be careful with that term twilight he's he's got that hashtag um keep riding until the fun stops and in some ways i find that inspiring because of course riding is always fun but it's also I mean, riding is perpetually fun, Jeff. Um, so, you know, are, are you perpetually going to, to, to keep at this? Like, surely things will change with age. And, you know, he does give some hints in this interview about uh, what his future may hold post-racing. I'm not going to say post-riding, but uh, maybe where he's looking, uh, yeah, at a post-racing career, even though he's still looking... Like you said, pretty darn fast on a bike. 
maybe not twilight, maybe late summer, maybe late summer of his career. Maybe the he's in the August of his career, of the season of his of his career. It's still it's still warm August, and and Jeff Gabush is going to be crushing it. And with that, let's listen to my interview with Jeff Kabush. Jeff Kabush, we are speaking just before your birthday, so happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have a birthday ride planned or anything, possibly? No, I mean, I'm just not big on celebrations, so I like to kind of fly under the radar, but going to actually meet up with some friends for dinner on the 13th and uh, do a little celebration, I'm sure. Sure go for a little bike ride as well. Excellent. So far this year, you've done about three big events, Mob Rocks, the Cactus Cup, and the Huffmaster Hopper. With all of these events, you have a long history. In the case of the Cactus Cup, uh, you went there, I believe, for the first time in 1996. Yeah. You've seen these events evolve. Is there anything they share in common with their evolution? Man, I don't know. I mean, I'm choosing these events, I guess, because they're fun events. I mean, yeah, I'm turning turning 46. So these days I'm looking for fun events that motivate me. But I mean, all those events have had a really different lifespan. I mean, Cactus Cup back in the day was one of the biggest events in North America, kind of the, the season opener. And it's just so fun to go back for some flat desert signal track fun opener. And, and I mean, the Huff, Huffmaster Grasshoppers are just a fantastic community building event that yeah started 20 years ago as just a small underground group ride and yeah i started doing it when they had to finally become official and get some waivers signed and i mean yeah with the the evolution of the sport they've turned into a pretty big pretty big deal these days for uh the early season in norcal and i mean moab rocks is just uh just an iconic venue that you know i read about uh starting out about the mountain biking in moab and it's just another venue that I just love going back to visit. Really special riding there, even though this year was pretty pretty gnarly weather. That's right. You had snow and, and cold in the desert. Yeah. I mean, a week later would have been wonderful. But yeah, we had some snow and ice. And uh, the last couple of days, thankfully, we got off. But we were starting at minus two Celsius on the, the rough rocks. And man, along with wearing everything, just suspension feels so slow and harsh, that cold weather. but. And we had a really, really fun group this year and some competitive racing, which was great to see. Now, Moab Rocks is part of the Single Track series. You've had some input into that series, which is made up of established events. Can you tell me more about your role with the Single Track series? Yeah, I mean, I think it just evolved from, you know, the way the marketing's gone for off-road athletes in North America. And there's, I think, a bit of discontent from some mountain bikers who really loved mountain biking and, and riding good single track. And uh, Stephen DeVos came up with the idea to try to bring some focus back to some really fun single track events. For me, like in my career at this point, it's I want to do events that I'm kind of motivated and excited about. And so most of all, I mean, I ride all kinds of bikes, but uh, my passion for sure is riding mount- mountain bikes on single track. And um, so I was excited about the idea and helping Steven out and the single track series this year, just focusing on Moab rocks and grand junction, Whistleback 40 and Downeyville classic, which are just, you know, really fun technical mountain bike events that motivate me. And we're hoping to kind of motivate some mountain bikers to do, but also showcase these new mountain bikes and equipment on, on trails that kind of show what these bikes can do. And there's, um, Lots of room for other events in North America on the gravel scene, but I think the idea was started by this desire to do more mountain biking on mountain bike trails. And uh, so it's kind of been a fun project to kind of help Stephen out with. Has mountain biking kind of taken a, taken a hit because of the, the rise of gravel? Is that is that maybe another possible reason to provide attention and focus with the, a series format? I think for sure just... Um, the pandemic was just really hard on organizers in general. And um, the Epic Ride Series in North America had a ton of momentum pre-pandemic, but it was just really hard on organizers everywhere. And so 
we saw a pullback and obviously um, gravel has become really popular uh, for good reason. It's really accessible for so many different riders, but a lot of marketing got poured into that segment. And um, yeah, I mean, mountain biking, I mean, cross country racing in North America has kind of gone through some, some struggles. I mean, the World Cup is super popular and a great product, but domestically it's kind of struggled to find its niche. And um, yeah, I think we're just trying to help rejuvenate some focus. I mean, the mountain bikes have changed a lot and there's a lot of pretty amazing short travel mountain bikes. I mean, myself as a rider and a lot of mountain bikers just love to to ride them. So we're hoping to bring some focus back to some of these, you know, classic mountain bike events that motivate us as riders. And hopefully there's a good story to tell there as well. You mentioned cross country, and I want to explore that a bit, especially in relation to Canada and Canadian racers. Compared with your era, let's say, when you were an active participant in Olympic cycles, even going back further to, say, Alison Sidor, and even recently with the close of Catherine Pendle's career, it seems Canada always had some top-ranked contenders in XC. Now, I don't want to take away from any of the hard work put in by today's athletes, but if I'm looking ahead to the Paris Olympics next year, it will be tough for Canada to qualify to send two women to the XC race. Tokyo was the first time Canada didn't send at least two men. And last year, Canada didn't send anyone to cross country at the Commonwealth Games, which usually helps as a preparation for the Olympics. So in in light of all of that, what are your thoughts on the state of cross country and Canada? I mean, the environment has really changed a lot. I think the biggest thing is it's the support and opportunities is the support from the industry, I should say, is is much harder to find. I think like in my era or Catherine's or Allison's, it was a very clear pathway. There wasn't as many disciplines. And I think the challenge these days, the paths have really diverged between personal Olympic goals and being able to support yourself as a career in the off-road discipline. A lot of the sponsorship and money in the off-road disciplines is focused on all these alternative disciplines and it's just splintered the direction you can go as an athlete which has created a lot of opportunities but made it more challenging for the olympic discipline and the the world cup has grown into like a fantastic showcase but the sponsorship uh, kind of return on investment is really focused on those kind of you know top five top ten riders who you see on the coverage and it's really expensive to uh pursue the Olympic dream, racing the World Cups around the world, and difficult to get that funding. And I mean, you just look at the opportunities this year for places on teams in North America, it's almost non-existent to uh, get that support. So a lot of young riders are having to go to Europe. And I feel like it's almost diverged into where the national team has become incredibly important to support those kind of Olympic dreams. It's really hard to balance that pursuit of Olympic dream xeos and this kind of alternative schedule which i'm on and a lot of gravel riders on it's really hard to balance those twos and i see a lot of great young talent is just kind of help figuring out how to nurture those through to the the top level at the world cup and it's uh much more challenging to get that support i'd say and that's why you're seeing a lot of these young talented riders struggling more to kind of follow through to the the world cup podiums and uh, on to the olympics you mentioned two things I want to touch on. The first is the, the role of teams. Things are very challenged in the, in the team department, let's say. Uh, Norco Factory's cross-country program closed at the end of last year. The, the Canyon project uh, disbanded. So former Canyon rider Laurie Arsenault has been able to build a small team. And before that, same with uh, Leandre Bouchard. But it's almost as if it, the teams are small and not much just a little bit bigger than, say, almost a privateer outfit. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like, is even a small team, uh, does that provide benefits and support that, that's needed? Or do you, does there need to be some sort of critical mass in a, in a team uh, team's infrastructure? I mean, I think it's it's a bit of a balance. Like, I don't want to say you need a ton of support to get to a certain level, but to get to that World Cup podium, I think that's where that full team support really helps. I mean, 
I like looking at development. I think it's important to create a balance so the the young riders are really driven and have to fight for it. I mean, like, uh, I mean, I went over to Europe by myself and stayed at hotels and figured it all out by myself. He was in as a junior, you know, traveled across the country and camped. So you, you can make it to a certain level based on motivation and hard work. But man, when you get to that fighting for world cup podiums, that's where it, um, having this team support and having that extra focus, uh, over in Europe, especially, is a challenge as North Americans to begin with. So, making that focus even smoother once you get to that top twenty, top ten World Cup. But until then, it's definitely a balance, and I think there's enough support there. But at the elite, elite level, that's where the the full factory team support really comes into hand. And I just feel like yeah, the the travel and expense challenges of this day and age are even even harder than when I started. It takes a lot of resources, which is challenging to fundraise um, unless you have a yeah full factory team. You offer your advice to young riders when they ask for it. Um, have you ever thought about getting more a more formal role in rider development? Yeah, I mean, I really enjoy sharing my experience. And, you know, I've been asked by young riders to coach or be involved a bit more, but um, right now I just really enjoy kind of having some one-on-one conversations and sharing my perspective, um, you know, what's important and the balance needed. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's hard. I'm still, you know, very active in my career, a lot of responsibilities these days, but for sure, um, it's something in the future I'd like to continue to be more involved with sharing my experience and, um, yeah, that perspective on the the sport that um, it's great to see Catherine Penderell involved with her, you know, practical experience in a, as a racer and a coaching role. And I think that's really important to pass on that, uh, that knowledge to the younger athletes because it can make a huge difference. I mean, like I mentioned there, there's, there's a lot to learn in this sport and how to balance it all. And hopefully I can um, help some riders out along the way. What's the most common advice uh, you find yourself giving young riders? Um, I think it's just, uh, you know, and what's important. Um, a lot of young riders get fixated on, on small things. And lately it's been a lot of riders been too data driven. I think we got some incredible tools as, a, as athletes this year, but I think the, uh, the body's much more complicated then you realize then uh, TSS score or Watts and see a lot of, I mean, with comparison culture as well, they see what top athletes are doing online as far as numbers and training and get too focused on chasing a certain wattage or hours and not reflecting on how they're feeling as a, an athlete and how complicated the body is and the need to understand their training and how to adjust for fatigue or heat or travel to Europe. I see a lot of riders just pushing through their training despite what's going on in life, stress, travel, and leading to a lot of burnout. So there's also always a lot of conversations around that, but then around sponsorship as well. And I think a lot of mistakes I see is young athletes or they think it's things are going to happen a lot quicker than they are and having the, the discipline to stick with things long-term. I mean, to get to the top level of the sport takes, takes long-term commitment. You got to wrap your head around that just from developing your body, but also developing sponsorships. A lot of people think uh, you get those results and the sponsorships immediately going to come, but like in everything in life, it's building those relationships take a long time and not asking for, to, for too much up front pays off in the long run. And uh, it's a big reason why I'm still in the industry is the relationships that I built over a long time in my career. Yeah, it's uh, both of them are, are endurance sports, if you will, like the, the athletic part and also the, the building of relationships and, and uh, networking. And to your point, like on the roadside, we see these young phenomenons winning the, the, the Tour de France and you're just like, oh man, um, you know, I'm not winning the Tour of 23. I guess I'm not, I'm out. But like you yourself, I think had a, a slower 
build to the top levels of the sport. Yeah, I believe your your first time to Junior Worlds it wasn't exactly the best result. No, I outsprinted two people for 99th. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's another thing. Like um, you can put too much focus on success in the sport and like work yourself really hard, especially these days with the influence in culture to you know get a couple thousand dollars and. I mean, yeah, I didn't have success early on, but I also went to school all the way past my first Olympics. And going to school, I think, helped takes the focus and pressure off sport, but it's also a positive distraction. And I think a lot of young athletes would be almost better off to get a part-time job to support themselves and um, be able to f- put more focus on sport and take a little bit of stress off uh, chasing chasing things and influence in if they're if their goals are personal goals and chasing Olympics versus, you know, making a career, but it's, it's all a balance. And that's, what's really complicated about being an athlete these days. Is there a skill or set of skills that you've picked up because of cycling, but that you never would have associated with a career in racing and riding bikes? I'll give you an example of what I'm thinking. Swain Tuft never never really liked public speaking, but it was a skill he had to develop throughout his career. So what are your unexpected skills? Oh, man, especially where I am in the sport right now, kind of creating my own program. I think, like I mentioned before, is building those relationships and contract negotiations. And it's, I mean, it's just a lot of subtle personal communication as well as, I guess, like almost PR consulting is like, especially these days, how to get a message out effectively without, you know, over commercializing things and connecting with people, um, writing. I mean, these days, um, the part I really enjoy, I mean, is work is a technical side of bikes. So I do a ton of work on my bike. So I'm constantly developing those skills with my equipment, which I think makes what I say more valuable, helping teach and what I know about equipment and relate that experience. But I mean, yeah, these days the athlete is expected to do a ton of different roles and responsibilities as a, as a privateer, as opposed to a factory team rider. So to be successful in this new, new age, you got to develop a a ton of different skills. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about your writing and, and the, the, the specific writing you do about gear, especially uh, on social media it seems to me like when you, when you post something about some tech that you're you're testing or trying out, it seems to me like a guy telling me about stuff he thinks is cool. Is is that a fair assessment of your uh, approach? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's what part of what attracted me to the sport was the kind of the mechanical aspect. I was, you know, pretty fascinated by bikes as a young rider and it was pretty intimidating at first all these fancy words like derailleur and uh <laughs> shifting and intimidating how it worked i mean these days it's so much easier with uh with the internet and youtube to figure out how to do things but i mean i've always been fascinated by that mechanical side and what's been really fun i mean i've r- ridden so many disciplines and so i have a perspective from all the disciplines, all the equipment and what can benefit certain ways. And I mean, that's a big part of my role is the R and D and development and having that perspective across disciplines really helps there, but it's something, yeah, that excites me and motivates me. And after racing, I hope to be involved in R and D and development work as well. So it's, yeah, something I'm passionate about and that's kind of my box you'd say is what, uh, what my passion is and what I'd like to share uh, on social media is that side of the sport and what I'm interested in. What gear are you most excited about lately? I mean, the last several years, it's been, I mean, a ton of fun just playing around on drop bars and seeing how far I can push them. I mean, call it underbiking, but it's just been, been a kind of a ton of fun riding drop bars off road on technical stuff. It's always a little fun being on the edge and, Testing a few products like Fox's fork and tire inserts and different geometries. And uh, yeah, it's, it's always fun to kind of push the limits and see what works and what doesn't work. 
but yeah, and then I mean, even I don't know, I'm still progressing and learning um, on the mountain bike, and I mean, I didn't grow up jumping, but it's always fun learning new skills and having time to kind of progress. And it's yeah, it's even amazing for me to look at my comfort level on on certain features five years ago as to now, and that's what's fun about the sport. There's always um, something to progress on. Is there anything uh, you'd like to see in terms of bike gear? Like, do you, can you identify any gaps that could be filled with a certain innovation or a certain change? Mountain bikes these days are pretty amazing. I've been uh, waiting for, you know, internal gearboxes and drivetrains, but I don't, I don't know if that's coming anytime soon. A lot of hurdles, but I mean, in general, mountain bikes are pretty amazing these days. And uh, it's just been, I think, slow modifications we've seen geometry change a ton in the last five years a lot of progress there but i think that's kind of balancing out for now and um i mean i'm most interested playing around with the gravel bikes and i think seeing some geometry adjusted gravel frame sets to accommodate a suspension fork that's where i'm messing around right now with putting the fox fork on my open gravel bikes but it really kind of jacks up the front end a ton because it's not uh, designed around that kind of length of fork. So I'd be uh, excited to see some kind of geometry adjusted gravel bikes that kind of incorporate the the length of the fork and kind of see how that geometry develops over the next couple of years. What is the right amount of flare in a drop bar bike for you? Or can that change from course to course like tire selection? Yeah, I mean, I've ridden a flare bar a bit, and I don't know if I'm 100%. It definitely is more comfortable, but I find, like, the big big development, like, in the last couple of years is how good the brakes are. I mean, I ride Shimano GRX, and so used to not be able to ride in the hoods, but, man, the, the hoods and brakes are so good, I stay in the hoods, even in a lot of rough technical stuff. I've just been testing out some flare bars now, and I'm not a huge fan of really wide flares. I think a little bit of flare gives a little more stability for sure, but I think I just, I love to, the routes you can put together on a gravel bike that involve a lot of road riding, trails, pathways as well. And so I don't like getting too wide and the aerodynamics on a really wide flare bar really feel like I'm kind of a parachute so I don't uh, prefer to go too wide um, mainly because I I don't use the flares too much descending with how good the the brakes and hoods and ergonomics are so still playing around a bit with that but I'm definitely hesitant to even a 44 centimeter flare bar I'm running from from Easton right now Uh, and the hoods feels uh, good but the flares feel quite wide when I'm kind of riding on the, the fast so i might even try a, a narrower bar that makes the, the flares not not uh too spread out there but yeah you gotta you gotta adjust the geometry for that just like riding a running a wider riser bar um change the user position and the length of stem still a lot of work to do i think to iron out the all the new developments on the gravel bikes for sure i find with some bars and their flare and especially when you're in the hoods it messes with your wrist position so i'm i'm usually hesitant to get too flary depending of course depending on the bar and how it actually affects the 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 tilt of the hoods yeah and i'm i mean i'm big on aesthetics too so it's a bit off-putting to see all these hoods turned way inside to get aerodynamics and i mean i'm all about function and feel but aesthetics aesthetics uh, how a bike looks matters to me too <laughs> nice you mentioned the term underbiking it's it's a term I, I very much associate with you um it's used to describe uh, curly bar bike rides on rough terrain um but i don't think you coined it i could be mistaken but the the word nerd in me really wants to know the history of this term and sort of your history with this term yeah, I mean, I definitely didn't invent the term. I know I started the hashtag on Instagram, but uh, I think underbiking dates way, way back before Instagram. But <laughs> it's just something that uh, I've just really enjoyed, especially when I had so much time off. Um, 
during the pandemic, I did a ton of gravel, kind of pushing the limits. And that's sort of kind of like when Kushkor and tire inserts and then testing the fork and really had a lot of fun when I went out and uh, rode the white rim on a gravel bike in the Cocapelli Trail and then started riding more and more technical trails, even doing some rock slabs and definitely not the only one pushing the limits. I've seen some pretty crazy stuff on, on drop bars, but just something I was having a ton of fun with and wanted to share with my audience and kind of, it's uh, still a bit of a joke, but had a small gathering on Hornby Island where I think it's pretty incredible drop bar riding on single track and had the inaugural underbiking world championships there. Fun, fun little group ride. So probably do that kind of as an annual fun slash joke ride on, on Hornby had a, a great time there last year. And, uh, yeah, just something I'm, I have a ton of fun doing and like to share that experience. That, uh, the underbiking world championships reminds me of, well, your sense of humor. Um, <laughs> and it's can be very dry, can be very sarcastic. And of course the danger of that is on online sarcasm often falls flat. Yeah, you need a sarcasm font sometimes, for sure. That's right, that would help. Maybe we should bring back flashing <laughs> fonts. But um, have you ever had your sarcasm, your humor go colossally wrong? I've definitely had people misinterpret it, but that makes sometimes makes me laugh even more, for sure. <laughs> um, I think, especially in recent years, um, the gravel community has had a hard time laughing at themselves. But that doesn't stop me from making a lot of jokes, If even if uh, some of the gravel community gets offended. But hey, as long as I make myself laugh, that's all that I'm worried about. <laughs> someone is sure to be laughing with you, but s- someone might be angry. If I can make myself laugh, that's my test, whether I should post anything or not. So sometimes it's just me, but uh, usually there's a few other, at least a few other friends who get my jokes even if some of them are inside jokes. So you've used your humor to, 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 to poke at things, maybe things that, uh, that are truly funny, maybe things that deserve a, a bit of a prod, maybe arrow bars in gravel races. That's a, that's a classic target that we've associated with you. But you're also not afraid to speak your mind on, uh, say, more serious matters. For example, cheating in sport and doping. Uh, you're not afraid to speak out against things. And I'm just wondering, uh, there are people earlier in your career who it's now well known that they've cheated. Um, are you, what is your relationship with these people? Or maybe what I'm asking is, are you still angry? No, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm angry. I've, I'm really happy where I'm at the sport and very proud of the decisions I made. Obviously lost lost out on some opportunities over my career to cheating in sport. And part of my role right now is obviously I'm an advocate for clean sport um, to share my perspective. And I think um, there's a lot of new cyclists coming into the sport that aren't aware of the history. And um, I guess I, I want to remind people the history and uh, not that I that hold a grudge, but when I haven't seen any truth and reconciliation. Happy to remind people of the facts. And uh, there's still in the sport a lot of people that cheated in prominent roles. And um, I just don't want to see the the normalization of that behavior, especially when these people are still profiting off the sport and never really had any any truth and reconciliation. So I'm I'm happy to remind people of of what happened in the sport and the the facts and how it affected. I think. A lot of my friends, I think you hear the voices and um, of dopers because they're still in prominent positions, but you don't hear the voices of the people that were forced out of the sport and that I saw this personally. So I'm more than happy to, to kind of clarify and remind people of the circumstances and what happened and speak up for those riders who the athletes, you don't, you don't hear their, hear their voices in the media. I was just lucky that I yeah survived in the sport and um, was able to have success and I'm still here and certainly in a much better space I think than uh, still enjoying the sport than a lot of people that uh, 
had to face some of the consequences of the decisions, but um, I don't have anything personally against. And I see some people regularly and um, happy for them to pursue things in their private life, but definitely have uh, some opposition to seeing them mentoring or coaching young athletes with when they haven't, you know, really ever had any truth and reconciliation or a role in, you know, with the with cycling can, I took a very strong position about their involvement in uh sport funded by the government and positions of power. And uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's important to set a clear example and um, share my story of, of what I see as important in sport. Is your sense or what is your sense of the playing field today? Is it better for clean athletes? Yeah. I mean, for sure. It was just rampant during my career and, there's no way I'm going to say it's it's clean these days. There's been a lot of advancements, but it's always going to be a, a battle for, for clean sport. But I think the biggest difference is people know it's wrong now. I think it was really normalized and people during my era, I'm talking late 90s, early 2000s, they didn't think they were doing anything wrong. But I think now people know that it's wrong to dope, but that doesn't stop people from taking those risks when there's still some, some big rewards out there. I think um, it follows the money in the sport where there's big money. People are, are willing to still take risks. Part of the, the cycle you saw in mountain biking, it cleaned up as the rewards weren't there, but the money isn't the only reason, you know, people cheat. It's uh, a lot for ego. That's why you still see a lot of masters getting busted for doping because they, uh, different different motivations for sport but for me it's i mean sports have always been kind of intrinsically motivated to see what i can do in the sport and that's i think why i chose to never take any shortcuts is because i wanted to see what i could achieve in the sport and really ruin the whole reason that i i love the sport if i i knew i'd only be really cheating myself if i'd taken drugs okay um i would like to speak with coach k for a second Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> you refer to yourself as Coach K when you talk training online. Um, is Coach K like a different persona? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's just some some inside joke humor for sure. I think I don't know if uh, Scott Kelly started calling me Coach K when I came over to Christmas Cross to help out with the cyclocross program a bit and uh, ride with some of the kids just to share some of my advice and course knowledge and then uh, i mean it really kind of solidified the joke when i did the belgian cyclocross training video on youtube if you've seen my uh training techniques on that uh 50 push-ups and two beers in in one minute but yeah i've done a few posts recently just kind of sharing my perspective to you know i talked to a lot of young athletes but i think it's uh, fun to have that broader discussion, putting some posts on, on Instagram for more young athletes to see. Because, yeah, you just see these, even like I said, training hours, you see, you know, specializing early and doing these massive hours. But, you know, like I like to remind people, like I never rode in the winter until after high school. And, you know, my peak of my career I did, you know, 750 to eight. 150 hours max and it's really you know given perspective because you only see online people doing these uh massive training hours and when they're feeling good so it's good to kind of add some perspective i guess so athletes have a more realistic picture of what it takes and what you need to do to have success in the sport you mentioned the push-ups and uh, i was going to bring that up for me just a let's say a master's rider who wants to simply be stronger on the bike and improve my performance. How many push-ups should I be able to do? Uh, I mean, for, for mountain biking, I think it's just, again, like perspective, a lot of people focusing on the wrong things. And yeah, I think the, the upper body endurance is a huge part of mountain biking as far as recovering and, and being sexful on a mountain bike. I've made some suggestions, 50 push-ups for for guys at the elite level, but in a row or over the course of a few days in a row, 50. Yeah. Like, uh, people don't realize how important that, that upper body endurance strength is. Um, 
Well, what does it give you? What does that upper body strength give you? Like I told the story, of like we used to do a lot of lactate testing and we did some testing where we just did a long descent, like uh, hardly pedaling at the bottom. Our, our lactate level was, was quite elevated and that's because the, the upper body was just overloaded from riding single track. I mean, you can experience that if you just go ride a pump track without pedaling and, and do 30 seconds on a pump track, you'll be gassed because your core and upper body is just overloaded. So it's important to have that muscular endurance in the core as well as the upper body. So you might not be pedaling on descent in a mountain bike, but you don't want your system to be over the limit because that'll affect you on the next climb. So the more strength and muscular endurance you can have allows your, your whole body to recover quicker, which these days is like almost the most important thing in XCO is, I mean, it's such hard climbs and hard descents. If you're not recovering and are over the limit on the descents, you're, you're quickly going to overload the system. So having that kind of muscular endurance in the upper body just allows you, your, your body not to load up as much on the more isometric descending, but also, you know, recover and, and recycle the, the system much, much quicker. So I'm definitely an advocate, you know, for you start, start with one push up and add one each day and see how far you can get. (laughs) I I will do coach K will do. All right. (laughs) I do want to ask you more about your training and how it's possibly changed over the years. You've been training seriously for, I'd say over uh, more than 20 years. Is there any practices that you used to do and that you think, well, we don't really approach it this way anymore. Technology has changed for sure. They use in training, but I almost think these days, like I mentioned before, there's almost too much focus on that data instead of feeling. But I really think training's much simpler than most people realize, and a lot of coaching is mostly to keep athletes entertained. I mean, I just like. Workouts can be much more complicated just to keep athletes entertained than they, they need to be. And I mean, it goes back to simple philosophy that's, I don't know how old, but kind of like 80% should be basic endurance and 20% kind of a bit higher intensity. I don't think I don't stray from that too much. It's like I have these basic building blocks that I integrated in my training throughout my career. And it's just, man, as I get older, I just, the body can't keep up with the head anymore and I think I have to be really disciplined now as an older athlete that I don't push too hard I got to be really careful with my body because if I push over the the edge out of equilibrium it just takes a really long time to to bring my body back but in general it's like yes these basic training building blocks whether they're long slow rides some tempo threshold I mean people have all kinds of uh, names for them and a bit of intensity it's the same balance, but my body can't uh, handle as much load and recover as quickly. So, yeah, I just have to be be careful with the prep, and the body is still a mystery for sure. Sometimes you your body can feel invincible, and you can take a tremendous load, and sometimes uh, you feel really fragile, and you just have to be really aware of how your your body's feeling and what's going on in life, and be ready to adjust. You know, for different circumstances. When I was younger, if I pushed over, I could take one or two days fully off and bounce back. And now I just have to be really careful with that because it could take me a week or two to kind of get that those good sensations back if I push too hard. I've even heard of younger riders, like, say, doing a race like Unbound, and the, the amount of recovery time is just... Like even Michael, I think it was Michael Vandenham who said, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing Unbound this year because, the, because of the necessary recovery time. How does a, a race like that, uh, what kind of recovery time do you need from a race like, like Unbound? Yeah, I mean, it blows my mind. I don't know. These, the gravel races, they're just, it's a bit of a competition to see how long and how hard they can be. But yeah, I mean, that last time I did it, it just felt unhealthy and uh if it's a bit hard and you get behind on a nutrition and have to push through an extra four or five hours in a depleted state, you can really, I think, yeah, like I said, it can do a lot of damage. But yeah, I mean, if you stay within yourself in a race that long on nutrition and how hard you push, it it might not be too bad. Like I did, I did the Coca Pelli Trail last year, or the year before, it was ten and a half hours, but it was 
self-paced and I was, you know, stayed within myself and I was on a nutrition plan and actually didn't feel too bad like the next week after because I was able to kind of control it and take care of myself and stay within myself. And these mega long gravel races, if you push over the limit and go under bed early, you can, um, yeah, do some damage that can take a long time to recover. So it's definitely serious consideration for these young athletes that are trying to balance a full summer schedule of um, whether to take on some of these um, ultra endurance events like Unbound. Jeff Kabush, part of your longevity in cycling is your ability to balance your goals with trends in the sport. Are you able to look into your crystal ball and see what's coming next? Or or at least maybe the direction that things will go? Um, I mean, I see the gravel bubble pop it a bit, and I hope it's going to swing back to more fun mountain biking because that's where <laughs> I'd like to see... The, these ultra endurance gravel rides are really rewarding, but I see some space for more interesting courses. I mean, I'm a big fan of underbiking, but yeah, I I see some events going to like nicer locations with more interesting courses and venues, and bringing back the distance so people can really enjoy the weekend festivities and the social aspect creating a better experience as opposed to these ultra Ironman distance scroll events that definitely have their space, but I don't think those need to be every weekend. So I can definitely see a shift. I think I've already talked to some organizers where people aren't signing up. I mean, these gravel races have multiple distances and more and more people are opting for the somewhat, you know, a hundred miles is long enough distance so they can do the event and not be completely smashed and still enjoy the weekend. Um, So I'm hoping there's a shift in, in that segment of the the gravel racing to more enjoyable experience as opposed to the, the ultra endurance challenge. But um, I'm also hoping that there's just a shift like in the single track series, both back to, you know, single track events that are fun challenge for both riders and the, and the bikes that we ride, which are pretty amazing these days. I see your career as having two parts. The first part having ended around the end of 2016 when you moved on from the Three Rocks team. Is that a fair breakdown or do you see more parts to your career? Yeah, I mean, I had the World Cup XC program, but throughout my career, I was always interested in doing different disciplines, you know, cyclocross in the off season or as early as 2012, 2013, I started doing some of the the blind enduro events like Transfervance, but it was definitely a big shift when I left a supported factory team. And what I've really enjoyed, I think, since then, starting, I think, 2017, 2018, as I had, you know, full control over what I wanted to do and what I was passionate about. And it's been fun to have that, you know, control and it's a lot of extra responsibility nonstop behind the, the scenes, a lot more work, but it's fun to just be able to, you know, have full control of what I want to do and what I want to chase. And man, I, I'm, I'm here still in the sport because of my world cup career, but, uh, sure. Really enjoyable. Now all the events and different and different events I get to still do in the sport. You've mentioned, uh, in various uh, venues that there's there's always something new to learn in cycling. And r- earlier you mentioned um, getting a bit more air. <laughs> is is there something new that you've you've learned recently? I mean, the equipment is is always involving in a part that I really enjoy testing out and pushing limits on on different components. Like we've talked about the gravel bikes, how they're involving, but. It's also as an athlete, um, especially the last couple of years, have a lot of discussions about athlete or influencers and watching that challenge for athletes involves. And I think we're even seeing that right now with the commercialization of, of Instagram and how to balance that and how to how athletes manage that and their mental health has been interesting and challenging to watch. And um, it's still really complicated and uh, be interesting to see how that evolves in the next next five years as well how that how that's balanced in the industry and the marketing goals of the companies and just the balance of personal and um 
you know, commercial life online for athletes is, uh, it's been interesting to watch and certain, uh, feelings that like, I'm kind of glad I'm at the end of my career. Cause man, it seems really challenging, but, uh, most of all, I'm just going to keep on doing what motivates me and I have fun doing. And if people want to support that, which a lot of people in the industry, I'm very grateful they are, I'll keep doing that and trying to, to share that experience that, yeah, I mean, I hope I really enjoy the in-person interactions uh, more than the online, but some people are thriving there and some athletes aren't. And so it's, yeah, it's uh, challenging to watch the, the new paradigm and we'll, we'll see where it goes the next couple of years. What's ahead of you in terms of racing uh, in 2023? Pretty busy spring with uh, Sea Otter and Whiskey Off-Road and Grand Junction. And then I'm uh, looking forward to getting back up to Canada uh, for the Whistler Back 40 and a few other events and really excited about BC Bike Race coming back to Vancouver Island and um, Downeyville finally coming back after a long hiatus over the pandemic years. Really excited for that one. So a lot of fun, fun single track. That's what motivates me. And uh, I'm always looking for, for new events and uh, not even sure what's on the, the second half of the summer program, but probably be heading back for some pain at Breck Epic stage race with Yeti, Yeti supporting. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm just excited right now, looking, um, planning ahead, looking at where we're going to be racing at, at uh, BC Bike Race and Whistler Back 40. I, yeah, I can't wait to get back up to Canada and, and ride some of the single track up there. Well, Jeff, um, it sounds like a load of fun. I know um, y- your, your mantra is uh, keep riding until the fun stops and it doesn't look like it's ever gonna stop so enjoy thanks yeah never never imagined i'd still be racing my bike for a living almost 46 but uh yeah having having a lot of fun for sure thanks great to talk and that's the episode and that's the episode (sighs) Yes, thank you, thank you. We needed that. We needed you to to help. I'm like your hype man. <laughs> thank you, hype man. Um, that is the episode. It was written and edited by me, Matthew Piaro. I I had some help from Matt Hanson. I can't remember. Did you help? How do I hang up? All right, stay on the line, caller. Uh, I definitely had help from Terry McCall. Uh, he helped me uh, prepare some of those interview questions. Oh, no, you did help a bit. You did have a one or a bit. A bit. You did. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. The Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast is produced by Adam Killick. He does the music, too. Thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. And, Matt, I'm, I'm still reeling from Roubaix. Roubaix. Is that going to catch on? Oh, my God. Um, You know, it it keeps making... You're the kind of guy that keeps making the joke over and over again until it's funny. See, this is is what you do, you know? Listeners can't see the smoke coming out of my ears (laughs) as you say those words because it is, in fact, the exact opposite is true. You are the Matt with the running gags. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Ride safe, and we'll talk to you later. We'll talk to you later. Ah. <sighs>